I'm preaching on the topic of eternal security of the believer, what's known as once saved, always saved. So I just wanted to remind us of this truth this morning, also teach it to some of the newer people in our church this morning. It's such an important doctrine, once saved, always saved. And I am firmly once saved, always saved. And that means, so, and what I mean by once saved, always saved is once you have received eternal life, there is absolutely no way you can ever end up in hell. And people understand different things by this phrase, once saved, always saved. And I'll address that uh, at the, uh, after, uh, in the later part of the sermon. But you might say, what, there's nothing they can do once you receive eternal life to ever go to hell? Absolutely. Nothing you can do to ever go to hell. That's what it means to be eternally secure. Once saved, always saved. You say, well, what about this? What if they did this? What about that? Nothing that they do can send them to hell. And obviously there are some questions surrounding around that, and I'll address that later. So that's what I mean by once saved, always saved. This is assurance of salvation. This is true assurance. Right? Assurance of salvation doesn't come from something that I do. Right? Because if it came from something I do, I could mess it up. Right? So it's not an assurance based on something I do, but it's an assurance based on what Jesus has already done. And that's why it's in the past. So it's final. He's done everything that was required to save me. It's done, and therefore it's confirmed. Praise God. And I don't believe once saved, always saved is something that is different to the gospel. You know, this is just two sides of the same coin. It's something that is intrinsic to the gospel, and it's the logical conclusion of the gospel. Right? If we're saved by grace, Jesus died for our sins, eternal security is something that logically flows on from that. And ultimately I find, you know, ultimately I find those that reject this doctrine, reject the doctrine of eternal security, reject once saved, always saved, ultimately I find that they end up either preaching or believing a works-based salvation. You know, when you talk to them, and even though they claim to believe in salvation by grace, they end up practicing and preaching salvation by works. Now, is it possible that these people are still saved? Yeah, sure, it's possible. And I sure hope that's the case. Um, they could just be a saved person that is, you know, deceived into believing that they have to do certain works in order to stay saved or to, 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 to keep their salvation, uh, you know, or in fact, they're not saved. So whenever somebody believes a false doctrine, they can always sit in two categories. They can either be somebody that's confused on the topic, deceived on the topic, or they can truly be somebody that's not saved, right? So we, you just need to make sure, like the Bible says, you examine yourself, whether you're in the faith, to make sure you actually believe the right thing, you know, to make sure that you're actually trusting on Jesus Christ, and you may just be a little confused on this doctrine. So two main areas I want to cover today. I'm going to go over five biblical reasons why I believe in once saved, always saved. And then the second part of the sermon, I'm going to talk about some main objections to this position and just talk through some of the more common ones. All right, so my first point is, why do I believe in once saved, always saved? The eternal security of the believer, right? So we're not talking about how do you tell if somebody is saved. We're not even talking about how do I tell that I'm saved? These are two different topics, right? There's a way that you tell you're saved and there's also the topic of, hey, what's the best way to tell if somebody else is saved? Now, we're talking about the doctrine of, hey, if somebody truly does believe and they have salvation, they actually have it, not that you just think they do, but they don't actually have it, they actually have salvation, can they ever go from a state of having salvation to no longer having salvation? That's what we talk about when we talk about eternal security. Now, one reason why I believe in once saved, always saved is by the very definition of everlasting life. And we read through John 11, but all through the book of John, you see the book of John the most, and it's not only in the book of John which mentions this phrase eternal life or everlasting life, but the book of John, it's almost like in every chapter, Jesus is just talking about this concept of having eternal life. John 3, 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So I just think these words are synonymous, but obviously in English you have eternal, meaning it never terminates, it doesn't end, and everlasting is it lasts forever. But I think in the Bible, I don't think there's a difference between the two. I think these are just interchangeable terms. Everlasting and eternal. John 4, look at what he says here to the, the woman at the well. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whoso drink, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. So notice how it's you'll never thirst. It's not one day you might get thirsty again if you're you know, not living right or you, you know, you're not saved anymore. No, once you drink of the water of life, you will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. John 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And notice this is present tense. This is what happens in the moment. You have everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. So notice what happens in the future. It lines up with the never thirsting. You'll not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. So notice there you have the past, the present, the past, the present, and the future. What happens in the believer's life the moment they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and call upon the name of the Lord. John 6, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Notice, present tense. It's not you will get everlasting life. You have everlasting life the moment you put your belief on Jesus Christ. You put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. John 10, 28, I give unto them eternal life. Look at this. And they shall never perish. Never perish. Now, does never mean never? When Jesus says you have eternal life, you'll never perish. That means if you perish for whatever reason, this, this statement is a lie. If he's giving you eternal life and then you perish, like in John 3, 16, where he says should not perish but have everlasting life, then Jesus is lying here. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And then John 11, which we talked about. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And let me ask you, believest thou this? Do you believe this? Do you believe that everlasting life is eternal life? Because by the very definition, that means it lasts forever. Now how can something that is everlasting last any shorter than ever and it's everlasting right so if, it, if it's everlasting life and it lasts less than forever then that's not everlasting life so by the very definition of the word eternal and everlasting life that's why it's it's once saved always saved now people will say oh yeah but god won't take it from you but you can give it away you know, they say, like, you, you, God won't take your everlasting life, but if you can give it... Now, think about it. But if I... We're not talking about possessing an object here. We're talking about everlasting life. It's a state of actually being alive or dead. If I, if I could give away everlasting life, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to die. So how can I give... How can, if I could give away everlasting life, then it would cause me to die, and by definition, I would no longer be alive forever. So you see how... You can't give away this gift. The analogy of a gift is being likened so you can understand that it's free, that it's received. But that's where the analogy ends. You can't say, well, I have this gift, now I can depossess it, right? Because God will not let you depossess it. That's the thing. Because it's everla He's given you everlasting life and you'll never perish. This is why you can't give it away, just like a physical possession. Life that is lost is death, isn't it? And let me ask you, are you more powerful than God? And if God gives you everlasting life, how are you able to undo something that God has done? Right? So we are not more powerful than God. You can't end something that God has made eternal. Right? That's why it's everlasting life. 
Last verse in this section, 1 John 5. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. So notice he didn't give us temporary life. The record is not that he gave us conditional life. He gave us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You may know that you have eternal life. Now, how can you know you have eternal life today if you don't know whether you'll have it tomorrow? Right? So if, if, you, if, if you can lose everlasting life, then you can't know that you have it today. But the fact that you know that you can have it, you, you can know today that you have eternal life, then that means you can't lose it because you could, otherwise you would never know for sure. All right, so that's the first point by definition of the word eternal and everlasting. Second point is because salvation is not of work. So I'll read a couple of common verses to us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Another reason why I believe in once saved, always saved is because salvation is not of works. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's not what you do. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you please remember this verse. This is one you should have committed to memory. This is the go-to verse for Orthodox and Catholics and anybody that believes in a work salvation. Ephesians 2 just says it plainly. It's not of works. Romans 4. But to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So very, very clear, it is without works. So think about this. Salvation is not by works, it's by grace. So you didn't earn salvation by works. So if you didn't earn something by works, how can you lose it when you don't have works? Right? If I didn't gain salvation by works, why would a lack of works make me lose salvation? I didn't do works to get it to begin with. So it's this idea of, how can, why do I have to be good enough to keep salvation, but then salvation is obtained by grace? I, how can I lose something I never deserved to have to begin with? You know, I, I lose it because I'm not good enough, but I was never good enough to get it. So isn't that, it doesn't even make sense that you'd have to not, you can't be good enough to get it, and then yet you have to be good enough to keep it, right? Because then wouldn't that just say you'd automatically lose it? You'd lose it as soon as you obtained it, if the conditions change once you got salvation. So you lose, you, you lose salvation by works, and then you get it by grace. So think, think this through. Like, so salvation is, I gain salvation by grace because I couldn't earn it, but then I lose it by works. And then how do I get it back again? I get it back by grace. So they can't get it back by work. So it'd just be a constant like losing and gaining and losing and gaining and losing it because I'd, I'd lose it by work and then I'd gain it by grace again. So every time I lost it, I just get it immediately back because it's, because it's obtained by grace. But it's kept by works. You see, that doesn't make sense at all. So people always talk about losing salvation, but they never really think through, well, how do you get it back? Because if you lost it, you could just get it immediately back by grace. Right? So then, uh, that would be, so this, then, then it just becomes like, oh, do I have to just constantly maintain my salvation? But every time I've lost it, I just need to make sure I get it back by grace. You know? this, is just, this, is what, uh, this is why it's so silly. But, so you weren't good enough to get eternal life. How can you be bad enough to lose it? See, it's not us. It's not us that keep ourselves saved. I don't keep myself saved by anything I'm doing. Not even the state of my faith is keeping me saved. You know, once I receive the Lord Jesus Christ, I have eternal life. You know who's keeping me saved? Jesus is keeping me saved. Jude 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. You see, we're preserved in Jesus Christ. I don't preserve myself. In verse 24 of the same book, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So you see, it's Jesus that keeps us up and pre presents us to the Father. It's not our own doing. So people will say, you know, so it's not me keeping myself saved. It's not my work. It's not even the state of my faith. Because people will ask the question, yeah, well, yeah, it's not by works, but what if you stop believing? 
if you stop believing, do you then lose salvation? Well, no, you don't. Hypothetically, you know, if somebody was to lose their faith, would they still be saved? Yes, because it's everlasting life. Because it's not about you. You just have to just receive salvation. And it's a one-way street. The moment you receive salvation, it's done. Now, now your job is over in terms of receiving salvation. God steps in and keeps you safe. Look at 2 Timothy 2. If we believe not, look at this, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So notice, it's, if, if you were to lose salvation, even if you were to not believe anymore, God would be a liar. See, God has to deny himself in order for you to lose salvation. Right? So you may deny God, but that doesn't mean he will deny you of salvation. Yeah, you may be denied of rewards. You may be denied of rain, right? If you, you, know, you deny the Lord Jesus Christ publicly and all that sort of stuff, you may, you may lose rewards, but you will not lose salvation. All right, let's go on to the third one. So the first one is it's by definition second one is it's not of works third reason i believe in once saved always saved is because it's an unchanging promise it's a promise that god has given us and like we sort of mentioned in second timothy 2 where he cannot deny himself why can't he deny himself because he's promised it he's sworn an oath already that salvation is given to those that believe look at first john 2 and this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. I mean, how much more clear can the Bible be when it uses the same verb for the noun, right? This is the promise that he's promised us, even eternal life. I mean, he's making it very clear that eternal life is promised by God. Titus 1. Now, why is a promise from God one thing so assuring? Titus 1, 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So why, why does it tie in the fact that God cannot lie with the promise that he's given us and why I'm saying, hey, this is an unchanging promise? Because I can promise you something, but I can lie. I can not keep my promise. Right? So let's say Victor Tay promises you something. You don't have 100% assurance because I'm a fallible man. I can, I can disappoint you. But God can't. He cannot do. He cannot lie. And this is why we know we have a full assurance because that unchanging promise is one of the reasons why eternal life is eternal. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So if you stop believing or you forsake God, God will not become a liar just because you forsake him right that's why in john 10 28 they'll never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand look at what how it words this in hebrews 6 when it talks about the promises of god to abraham for when god made promise to abraham because he could swear by no greater he swear by himself that's interesting most people when they swear an oath they swear to god right and then god is saying there's nobody greater than god so he swears it to himself right saying surely blessing i will bless thee and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. What is it saying? It's saying when somebody then swears it, they say, okay, now we, we know it's settled, right? There's no more strife. Right, it's done. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. And if you're familiar with your Bible, you know the phrase in the Bible, lay hold on eternal life. So it's talking about eternal life, which is the hope, right, that we have. And then we lay hold on it when we actually seek perfection, right, when we actually do those works. <clears throat> but notice here, what are the two immutable things? Because God already promising eternal life is already immutable. Right? It's unchanging. And that's what we're talking about, when he promised us eternal life. When he's talking about here, this promise he made to Abraham, right? and, and, it, and, it, and it flows on to us as well, right? this blessing of Abraham, 
He says, not only one immutable thing was his promise. The second immutable thing is that he swore an oath to himself, right? That by two immutable things, right? In which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Now, this gift, the, the gift of eternal life, it says this to us in Romans 6. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now notice that eternal life is likened to a gift. So that's where we get that analogy, that it's free. You just have to receive a gift and we can understand how we're being given something, even though it's not something physical. Now notice here in Romans 11, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Now don't misunderstand this verse. You know, I know, I know we'd love to use this verse for the repent of your sins crowd and say, hey, look, you, know, you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ without repentance. Right, without, without repenting of your sins. But what this verse is actually saying is, I don't, I, what, it's, what I believe it's actually teaching is that the repent doesn't come from God. God does not give, right? He doesn't give eternal life and then repent of it. So the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance from God. It's not saying that <laughs> the gifts and the calling of, of believing on salvation is without repentance. And that's a whole other topic. You know, like obviously repentance is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. The turning is the turning from dead works. You know, believing on dead works to believing on Jesus Christ. It is not turning from sin and believing on Jesus Christ. This is where people get it wrong. You have to turn from sin to believe on Jesus Christ. That's work salvation. But if you turn from trusting your dead works, right, which is your work salvation, to trusting Jesus Christ, that is the repentance in regards to salvation. Now, Hebrews 13, I'll just end point three on this one, his unchanging promise. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So notice, God will never leave you. So what's important to understand here is, yeah, you may leave God. You may forsake God. You may not live right and go, you know, I turn my back, you know, something bad might happen in your life and you may not understand why suffering occurs. Hey, how many times have you seen this happen to Christians? I can't believe God let this happen to me. If God loved me, he wouldn't let this happen. They just have this completely unbiblical view on the love of God. And because of it, they go, you know what? I'm done with church. I'm done with God. They forsake God. Now, you may forsake God, but what does God say? I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that's why you need to understand that you may try and get away from God, but he doesn't let you get away. And the analogy I always give is like when your child, if you're trying to hold on to your child's hand and they're trying to get away from you, the harder they pull, what do you do? The harder you grip. And that's what it's like with God. You know, he will never leave thee nor forsake thee. It's an unchanging promise, salvation, eternal life. All right, number four, fourth reason why I believe one saved always saved is full remission. Full remission. Now, what do I mean by that? It means, what I mean by that is Jesus has paid for all sins. Right? He's paid for all sins, past, present, and future. Let's look at a few verses. Hebrews 10, 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Right? Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Now, why is there no other offering for sin? Because Jesus was the one offering that paid for all sin. Right? So there only needs to be one offering. And look at what God says here. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, wouldn't God have to remember one of your sins and iniquities in order to send you to hell for them? Yeah. Right? So there you go. See, see that your sins and iniquities will I remember no more. He's removed our transgressions far from us, as far as the east is from the west. And what a beautiful analogy there. As far as the east is from the west. It's not like two locations, like two directions, right? From this way to that way. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Look at Isaiah 53. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem his stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity 
of us all. So notice the, the iniquity of everyone. And we see this phrase or this sort of um, con, uh, concept repeated throughout the Bible, that Jesus is the Saviour not just for us, but also for the whole world. First John 2, My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Even that is a phrase on eternal life. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 Timothy 4, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. So it's saying, hey, it's worthy for you to receive this saying. It's a faithful saying. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the saviour of all men, especially of those that believe. So notice he's the saviour of everyone, especially of those that believe. That means he's also the saviour of those who don't believe. It's just that they haven't mixed it with faith. It doesn't profit them. They haven't mixed it with faith. These things command and teach. Hebrews 10, look at this one. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So you see full remission, past, present, and future. I mean, you've got to ask the question in 1 Corinthians 15 when it says here, and I'll just skip over to verse 3, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So if Christ died for our sins, which sins did he die for? Did he only die for our sins in the past? You say, no, he died for our sins in the past, in the present, and in the future. And in fact, all our sins, when Jesus physically died on the cross, were in the future. Right? So our past sins were in his future. So why would he just stop at our present? Right? He died for all sins, past, present, and future. So when he went to the cross, he already died for every sin I will ever commit. He paid for the punishment of all my future sins. So you need to understand, you need to internalize it, you need to realize when Jesus died on the cross, it's not like you sin. Jesus died on the cross, he died for all sins. Your sins, past, present, and future. So you, you sin... And you think, well, that might sin might make me lose salvation. This sin might, might not be covered. But God knew all your sins from the past to the future. So even though a sin may surprise you, it doesn't surprise God. You know, it's like, it's like you sin and you say, well, I can't believe I did that. You know, God is not up in heaven saying, I can't believe you did that. You know what I mean? Because God already knew everything you were going to do. Nothing surprises God. And you know what? When he died on the cross, he died knowing full well every sin you would ever commit into the future and he paid for them he died he was buried descended into hell for three days and three nights and rose again for your sins all right so full remission and number five is sinless regeneration sinless regeneration now what do i mean by this i mean that when you are born again that new creature no longer sins right so if if you could lose salvation by sinning, right? Because one day we're going to shed this flesh. Why do we sin right now? Because I'm in this flesh. This flesh has desires, and I choose whether to walk in the spirit or walk in the flesh. But the new creature, right? My spirit is born again. My soul, you know, my spirit and soul together. I'm born again. That new creature does not sin. So the reason why I sin is I still have the flesh. Now, when I die and I shed my flesh, that new creature is sinless. So how am I losing salvation of that new creature when that new creature cannot sin anymore? Right? So the only reason why I'm sinning is my flesh. And one day I'm going to shed that. My flesh doesn't go to heaven. Right? Flesh does not, flesh and blood, right? Does not inherit the kingdom of God. But Jesus was flesh and bone. So that flesh and blood body is going to be shed. So how is my saved soul and spirit how is that ever going to become unsaved when it cannot sin? John 3, look at this. This is where Jesus said, We're born again. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. If you're not sure what that word listeth means, it just means wherever it wants, right? So it's related to the word lust, wherever it desires. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So you can't tell from where, 
it comes, and to where it goes. So from whence is from, whither is to. Cannot tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So you notice how we are born again. We're sons of God. John 1, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So just making it clear here, when we believe on Jesus Christ, we're born again. We're now sons of God, you know, in the, in the spirit and in the soul. Obviously, our flesh will be one day shed, and one day our flesh will be a son of God. But that's why the Bible talks about what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. The fact that we are not yet fully a son of God, God still treats us as a son of God. Right? Because one day we're going to shed the body, we're going to be given a new body at the resurrection, and that's when we're going to be adopted physically as sons. But right now, physically, we are begotten as sons. Now notice here what it says here about whosoever is born of God. So that's talking about the new creature, the spirit. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So notice there, we are born of God. We are begotten sons of God, and therefore we cannot sin. I'll just skip over these other verses just for the sake of time because I don't think that those really add anything to the point. All right, so we'll just go into a few objections now, just answer some questions. So remember, five reasons why I believe in one saved, always saved. One, definition of everlasting and eternal life. Two is it's because it's not of works. If I didn't earn it, I'm going to be bad enough to lose it. Third one is it's an unchanging promise. If I was to ever lose eternal life, that would make God a liar. Fourth is full remission. Why is there no sin that can send me to hell? Because Jesus has paid for everything. What sin is left? that would ever be able to send me from hell that God doesn't already know about. And the last one is sinless regeneration. The fact that my new creature cannot sin, what sin is it even going to? If you could lose salvation by sinning, it, it can't sin. So it would never lose its salvation. Right? The new creature. The only reason why I sin now is because I'm a sort of a two-part war, right? The spirit and the flesh, like in Galatians 5. They war together. And, and the battle we have now is to not be, you know, connected or not be married to the flesh anymore. That's why when we crucify it, and we'll, we'll see this in, in Romans 13 as we go through. But let's talk about some objections. First objection I have is when people say, ah, oh, well, you can't just live how you want and still go to heaven. Now, when people say that, to me, they misunderstand what once saved, always saved is. See, once saved, always saved is not even talking about how you should live as a Christian. Right? But because I don't know where they're getting this idea from or where they're getting it taught from, that once saved, always saved means you can live however you want. I think if you have this mentality of work salvation, some people are like, you know, when I'm out door to door and people are struggling with this concept, it's because for so long they believed you have to live a certain way to get to heaven. That when you just tell somebody, hey, you don't have to do any works. Even if you live a terrible life, you believe on Jesus, you'll still go to heaven. In their mind, they equate that with that's an all right way to live. That's a lifestyle that has somehow made you deserving of heaven. Right? It's like when you talk, sometimes you talk to an orthodox person, right? And you say believe, but they hear follow. So when you say you believe in Jesus, they say, yeah, you've got to believe in Jesus, you've got to follow. But they've got this misunderstanding of what believe means. And it's the same with one saved, always saved. Sometimes you mention one saved, always saved or something. I've had this conversation so many times with Pentecostals because I think they teach us this in the Pentecostal church where it's like, oh, beware of those one saved, always saved people because they're just teaching you can live however you want and whatever. And it's like, that's not what we mean by one saved, always saved. What we mean is you will still go to heaven. It doesn't mean it's okay or it's right to live that way. But see, because they associate going to heaven with a certain standard of living. What they hear when you say, hey, you'll go to heaven anyway, is, hey, it's, it's, it's okay to live that way, right? It's, it's an okay way to live in order for you to go to heaven. Now, if they say, well, you can't just live how you want and still go to heaven, my question is, well, do you believe in a work salvation? Because then, you know, is it you have to change how you live in order to go to heaven? Well, they say like, oh, you know, well, it's not that you have to be perfect, but, you know, it's just like the big ones, like, like murder and adultery. What, you mean like David? 
You know, we have like a different list of people. You know, you say like, oh yeah, it was just people that are like living a fornicating lifestyle. Well, like Samson? Yeah. You know, what about, oh no, but yeah, you can do all these, but if you commit suicide, oh, that's like way too serious. That's going too far. Like what? Like Saul? Samson? Also committed suicide as well. He pushed the pillars knowing he was going to kill himself. Oh, what about if they're just like a drunkard? Oh, you can't be a drunk. You can't live that sort of life and still be saved. Well, like Noah? No, when he got off the ark, became a husband and got drunk, and then, huh, and then uh, you know his, his, his uh, son saw him. I don't know if you guys are in the, or you guys are in the, in the Facebook group. I posted a really interesting video about um, seeing Cain, uh, Ham seeing his father's nakedness. I just thought it was it was a very good video by uh, a good explanation by that guy. But basically, he was saying that Ham didn't actually do anything to Noah he actually slept with his mother in order to try and usurp the patriarchy of the family. And then Noah cursing Canaan was actually doing the opposite, like making him a servant of his, of his brothers. So very interesting point, actually. Um, go, go, go watch the video if you haven't already in the Facebook group. What about you say, well, if somebody's really worldly, can't live however they want. What about Lot? Lot lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, called... The Sodomites, my you know, friends, you know, and even gave his daughters. But then the Bible calls him just Lot. Right? He was saved. So it's not about how you live, right? It's possible for believers to do very terrible things. Romans 13, look at this. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, and now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. So notice, this is the exhortation to believers. Now, if you didn't do works of darkness, how do you cast them off? Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. See, it was, if it was just automatic for us to live right, and once you get saved, you just never sinned anymore, or you just live this, this honest and pure and godly life, why do we have to be told, hey, don't walk honestly. Don't walk in riot, in drunkenness, in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. I put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. See, so you don't want to make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof because you can make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Now, what are some of the works of the flesh that are possible? Galatians 5. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery. So you know what adultery is? It's like sleeping with somebody that is married. Fornication. Fornication is just a broad category of sex outside of marriage, but generally what it's known as is sleeping with somebody that you're not married to, because generally, you know, adultery can be called fornication as well, but it's a more serious form of fornication, right? Because you can sleep with somebody you're not married to, and you may be forced to marry them, but obviously there's homosexuality, bestiality, uh, all that sort of stuff as well. Now, uncleanness. Uncleanness is interesting that, you know, obviously fornication is a type of uncleanness, but then, you know, it's always saying, like, God wants us to be clean people. You can be sin, sinful in the sense that you are excessively dirty, right? Not taking care of yourself. But I think there are other things that can be unclean too. Like, maybe you can think of pornography as being unclean. That you yourself are not committing adultery or committing fornication, but you are participating in things that are unclean. Right? Lasciviousness. So this is like excess. Lasciviousness is sort of like excess lust. You know, it's, like, it's like if you think about like a hedonistic lifestyle, just excess pleasure. It's like lasciviousness. Idolatry, right? Having gods other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Witchcraft, that's dealing with familiar spirits, Ouija boards, you know, going and get people, your fortune tellers and tarot readers, all that sort of stuff. It's witchcraft. Hatred is self-explanatory. Variance is, variance is when you are constantly going against people, right? So it's sort of like, it's, it's, it's slightly different to strife, because strife is just trouble in general, but variance is like when you're, if you, let's say you're rebelling against authority, right? That's a way to be at variance, right? When you're going against decisions just for that sake. Emulations, what's emulations? It's when you're fake and you're a phony, and you're double-minded, two-faced, right? Uh, did I miss some? Various emulations. Strath, uh, wrath is obviously anger without, without a cause because it's not always wrong to be angry. 
Strife. Problems. Now, what is seditions? Do you know what seditions? Seditions is like when you are like plotting to do things. You know, so it's, it's like when people do like a coup, you know, or they plot to like assassinate somebody. That's like, so you can have seditions to a lower degrees in your own life where you plot to do something evil with people, sort of scheming. Heresies. See, this is something, remember, this is why I say people that are saved can believe the wrong things. They can have some wrong beliefs and still yet be saved. Why? Because the flesh can be deceived into believing wrong things. So this is why you don't always just want to write somebody off just because they are a bit mixed up on some things. You know, they might be just a bit mixed up because it's possible for us to believe wrong things if we are not, you know, grounded and rooted in the Bible. Envyings. Envyings is when you desire things that belong to other people. Murders, killing people that are innocent, drunkenness, you know, excess uh, alcohol. Reveling. So revelings is like excess banqueting and partying, you know, like riotous living. Um, revelings and such like of the which I tell you before. As I've told, also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And you say like, hey, isn't this a verse that's telling you if you sin, you're not going to go to heaven? Yeah, well, this is what the flesh does. This is, I agree that your flesh isn't going to go to heaven. Right? Your flesh is going to be shed and you'll go to heaven, soul and spirit, and then at the resurrection, you're given a new body. Right? So that's why the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. And they which do such things, which is the flesh, because we're a new creature. Right? Our identity now is with God, as a son of God in the spirit. Romans 5, look what it says here. Moreover, oh, actually, this is my, this is my second point. So that was my first point, right? My first point is, my first objection, we can't just live however you want, no, because it's possible for believers to sin and still be saved. The second one is where people say, well, you don't just, because you're saved, you have this license to sin. And this is why they get this misunderstanding of, oh, once saved, always saved is. It's not about being okay to live however you want. What it is saying is no matter how much you sin, you're still saved. Romans 5, moreover the law entered, that the offence might abound. But where sin abounded, look at this, grace did much more abound. So notice the more you sin, the more grace abounds. And really, you know, the grace is already abound. Why does it abound more? Why does grace teach much more abound? Because the grace is already offered from beginning to end. So it's not like, it's not like, it's not this picture, because sometimes you, when you think of this picture, you think, okay, the more I sin, grace is just like staying in front it's just like it's just leading but it's not it's because the grace has already been paid for it's just there's no way the sin can catch up because grace is always going to abound much more because grace has paid for all sins the grace of the lord jesus christ so where they get it wrong is just because grace abounds when you sin this is where romans 6 comes in what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So you see, it's not the right thing. Nobody's saying it's the right thing to continue in sin. All we're saying is if you continued in sin, you would still be saved because you don't get to heaven by being good. You get to heaven because you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12. Now does that mean that there are no consequences at all? To somebody that lives in sin no there that, that's, that's not what it means all we're saying is hell is no longer a consequence right when you believe on the lord jesus christ hell is no longer a consequence because as you stand as an unbeliever before god you are a criminal worthy of capital punishment but when you believe on the lord jesus christ the relationship is different now now jesus has taken your capital punishment you are born again now the relationship is father and child now, a father will discipline his child, but you'll never go to hell. This is what Hebrews 12 is talking about. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, this chastening and this scourging can be quite serious. I mean, it could be death. I mean, God could remove you from the earth. But just because he removes you from the earth, that doesn't mean you're no longer his son, that you will, he will send you to hell. Now, like I said, I think people struggle to understand this concept because I think they've not yet comprehended 
salvation by grace. So you don't get to heaven by what you do. What you do has no bearing on where you end up. It's what you believe. But if you're still tying in what you do with where you end up, then you think, well, how can somebody who does this still go to heaven? Well, it's because it's not about what they do. It's about what they believe. What they do will decide whether or not they get chastisement from God. Now, you might ask the question, yeah, but what about, what about serial rapists? You know, what about murderers, or serial murderers, people that just get to that extent? Now, the way I answer this question is, well, hypothetically, if a, if a true believer did all those things, they would still be saved. Now, that's hypothetically. But the question is more, will God, you know, keeping this in mind, that God loves his children, he's going to chastise and scourge his children, will God let one of his children get to that point? That's more the question. I don't believe so, but hypothetically, is it possible that somebody could, you know, do some very heinous things and be saved? I think it's possible, but, you know, that's for God to decide how far he lets his children go. I mean, Saul committed some pretty grievous things. I mean, he slaughtered a bunch of priests. I mean, that's pretty bad, but he was saved. So people can do some pretty bad things. There are consequences to our sin. You know, it's not just hell that we're, you know, uh, it's, it's not just hell isn't the reason why we want to be doing good works. If heaven and hell is the reason why people are doing good works, that's a very good indicator that they're be believing in work salvation. Right? But why should we do good works? Because, you know, we fear chastisement. There's a lot of good reasons to do, to do good, you know, and besides heaven and hell. Two more. Now, somebody might say, now you can't just pray a prayer and then you're saved. Right? You can't, they'll say that. You know, once saved, always saved, which is not really what once saved, always saved is talking about. But they'll say something like, well, you can't just pray a prayer and then you're saved. Now, I don't know about you, but Romans 10, verse 13 says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it sounds to me that you do pray a prayer and then you do get saved. Now, what, what's the problem when people say you just pray a prayer and you shouldn't get saved? Well, because they mean, yeah, you don't just repeat some vain words and then you're saved, right? That's not, that's not even praying. Like, if you're praying, if, you're, if you think of prayer as reading words out of a book and not even, like, caring what they mean or what they even say, I mean, that's not praying. You know, that's just some religious ritual that people do. Prayer is when you actually speak from the heart and you actually call upon the Lord, believing what you're actually saying. So yeah, if you call upon the name of the Lord, if you pray to God, that's what saves you. But the question is just, did you mean it? Romans 10, 10, would you go back a couple of verses? For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So you see, you need to believe actually what you're praying to God. Now in order to believe what you're praying to God, you have to understand what you're praying to God. So obviously the under you hear first and then the understanding comes and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ by calling upon the name of the Lord. Now I'm not saying that there's no such thing as a false profession. You know, yeah, are there people out there that say they believe on Jesus Christ and don't actually believe on Jesus Christ? Yeah. You know, are there people that either are saying it, they don't actually mean what they say, or are there people that are saying it and they're just trying to like toe the, you know, what, you know, toe the line and they just know that's what everyone wants them to say and they don't actually believe it? Yeah, I'm sure there are people out there. These are, what, these are false professors, right? They're not actually testifying what they believe in their heart. But if somebody actually believes it, are they saved? Yes. So, yeah, there are, there are such things as a false profession. But let me say this, you don't change the gospel just because people are either lying or ignorant. You know, just because people don't know what they mean by what they say. Or there's somebody that's saying they believe saved and they're not really saved. I mean, am I going to change the gospel to try and weed these people out? I don't change the gospel. I don't pervert the gospel of Christ in order to try and weed out people that are not saved. And you know what? It's not even the right way to weed them out. Right? So you don't want to change the gospel to try and weed out these people. And I'm not saying you want to keep the gospel pure and just try your best to make sure that that's what they believe. And the question of how to best tell 
if somebody is actually saved, has no bearing on whether a truly saved person can lose salvation. Like I said in the beginning, if, we're, if the question is around how to tell somebody is truly saved, this is separate from once saved, always saved. And this is what I find when I talk to people about once saved, always saved, they start getting into, oh yeah, but what about this person? They did this and they get away. Are they actually saved? Yeah, but what if somebody just says it and they do this and they say, well, you're not even addressing now the topic of once saved, always saved. Now you're talking about, you know, how does somebody get saved? And you may be talking about, well, how do I know? Well, what's the best ways to tell if somebody is saved and what would give me assurance of their salvation? Not how did they get their assurance of salvation. We're not even talking about assurance of salvation. So assurance of salvation is how do you know you are saved now? And that's another topic as well. We're talking about if somebody is truly saved, whether they can ever go from a state of salvation to a state of no longer having salvation. And the last objection I just want to uh, address before we conclude is people will say, well, what about sins like blasphemy of the Holy Ghost and sins like taking the mark of the beast? Because the Bible says, hey, those people that blaspheme the Holy Ghost and never have forgiveness and the people that um, you know, take the mark of the beast, they'll, they'll definitely go to hell. Well, you just got to think through this logically, right? If you think through this logically, if I have everlasting life and there are sins that cannot be forgiven, then that means believers are not, it's not possible for believers to do those things, right? Because if it was, it was possible for me, to, if, that, if that is in my timeline, something that is unforgivable, then how can I be saved today? Right? Because Jesus already knew, so these people that do these things will never get saved, right? Because they're not covered. Well, that, that sin is not necessarily covered under the blood, you know, like blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. And taking the mark of the beast, like the Bible says, these people will go to hell because these are reprobates that are doing this. And well, once they do that, they become reprobate. So if you just think through it logically, these things that will cause somebody to never be able to be saved. How can a saved person do that? It doesn't make sense. And we even see this in Matthew 24, 24, especially when it comes to the mark of the beast. Because I don't think a believer, how can a believer blaspheme the Holy Ghost? I mean, a believer has to believe on the Word of God. They have to believe on the Spirit of God to be saved. Right? So that's obviously not blaspheming the Holy Ghost when you have to accept the Holy Ghost as the Savior. Right? You have to believe on the Word of God and the Word that Jesus speaks to us is Spirit. But look at what it says in regards to the end times and you know the deception that's going to go on that's going to tie in to taking the mark of the beast matthew 24 24 for there shall arise false christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect so you see like it, this is just one thing believers are not going to do now do i understand how this is going to all play out in the end times and how we're not going to be deceived there are different theories out there you know one is you know maybe just supernaturally you'll just know what's going on right and you, you won't be deceived into accepting the mark of the beast but another theory i've heard and it is very well possible is that the people that are like the lukewarm christians and they're just saying like well i'll just go down to service new south wales and get my mark of the beast you know and, you know and just i'll you know I'll, I'll just bow and just you know like everybody else and just worship the beast and blend in and hopefully i'll get it one theory people have is that you know you'll go and do that but they'll have technology where they can tell whether you're lying or not yeah. and really christians will just be lining up for the slaughter yeah. you know so you're not going to get deceived you'll go and try and you know play along and then you'll just be lining up for the slaughter because if you had read the bible you'd know you better flee right you better get out of there so that's all i'm going to cover in terms of objections so remember the five reasons why uh, we believe in once saved always saved you know by definition it's not of works the unchanging promise full remission and sinless regeneration now i just want to end this sermon on one last passage one last passage Romans 8. Romans 8 is a beautiful passage talking about the love of God and how we can never be separated from it. Verse 31. What shall we, say, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? 
Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. So notice, eternal life, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Jesus, our Lord. You know, I often hear people say that once saved, always saved, cheapens the grace of God, cheapens the love of God. But I think once you understand once saved, always saved, you know that God loves you no matter what. It actually exalts the love of God to think that God would love a sinner like me with an unchanging love. Isn't that an amazing thing? All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your promise of eternal life. Lord, it's such a blessing. I just, I just feel for the people that, you know, when I talk to them about soul winning and talk to Christians about soul winning and they don't believe once they've always saved, the peace and the joy and the love that they are missing out on. And uh, Lord, I just pray um, that this sermon clears up uh, this uh, doctrine to anyone hearing this sermon, either now or later online. And I just thank you so much, Lord, for the love of God we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's eternal security, it's eternal salvation. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.